Taylor Mickelson. Um, I'm the exhibitions director on the board of Enseca, but I'm also the executive director of Clay Art Center. So I have the extreme pleasure of, of introducing our former community arts director, Ariel Edwards. Ariel, uh, she got a, a, B, a BFA in, uh, from Maryland Institute College of Art, and then started her journey in, in community arts uh, as an AmeriCorps, what do you call yourself, artist? Um, and, then, uh, and then she started working with community arts programs at Baltimore Clayworks. And uh, we were lucky to have her come to Clay Arts Center in 2006. And she proceeded to, to grow our community arts program to what it is today, which is serving about 5,000 at-risk youth and, and adults with special needs. So she is going to talk to you about how she did that through largely a lot of our programs with community mosaics and putting clay in the hands of, of our neighbors and our youth and our community members. So without further ado, here is uh, Arielle Edwards. Good morning, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Okay, great. Um, well, I have to confess that the idea of public speaking has, has never really been something I've jumped at. Um, but I do feel like this topic is particularly relevant now um, and especially urgent because over the last 10 years we've seen a huge development and change in the way that we have engaged our communities. And so there's opportunity now um, to really kind of take that momentum and get started with it. So I'm going to um, have kind of a, a general overview of how I have done my process, but also I spoke with a lot of artists over the all over the country and you'll see some of their work, um, as well as some nonprofit organizations, to get a, a general idea of how they do their work. Because the theme for today is really you're going to see diversity um, in projects, in materials, in how they go about funding them, um, in the partnerships that they create, both public and private. Um, and so I hope that everyone will be able to kind of take that back to your own communities. Um, so let's get started. Before I really jump into the slide presentation, I do want to let everybody know that back there at the, um, at the technical table, I've left some materials um, about some of the more technical things, uh, the materials in the clay and the freeze thaw cycle um, that I will reference in my presentation. So if anybody has simultaneous things going on and needs to leave halfway through, make sure you grab some of that information back there. It also has my personal email address on it so that you can contact me, which I encourage you to do if you have any questions um, about doing this in your community. So thank you so much. So as you heard from Lee, <laughs> um, I spent the last uh, nine or 10 years at Clay Arts Center um, where we really were able to found and build a community arts program that now reaches about 5,000 people um, of various ages and abilities uh, through the ceramic arts. Uh, but we really discovered that one of those unique methods of engagement and mobilizing communities and getting everybody to share a vision and the excitement for a project came about because of public art. Um, and so slowly over time, we built up um, um, these mosaics of all different shapes and sizes in a relatively small and vulnerable community about 30 minutes north of New York City. So these are some of my projects that I'm first going to show you. Again, you're going to see very different methods. Um, so this is my particular experience and how I like to go about putting things together. Um, I appreciate hands-on in, in every aspect. So we create all of the tiles that we make together. Um, I have community members participate in the design process. Um, as well as making tiles, installing the projects, celebrating the projects, everything you can imagine. So these next few slides are all one project uh, that is with a K through five elementary school in Port Chester, New York, where the Clay Art Center is located. Um, and it represents about six years of a partnership with the school district there um, to turn a kind of a flagging uh, magnet school um, into a really academic powerhouse. Um, and they did that in a few different ways. The school had a priority to really turn this courtyard that was kind of disused and neglected into an outdoor classroom. Um, and so we really created these mosaics, not only to reiterate what they were learning in the classroom, um, but also to beautify the space and to really get the community on board with that idea. Um, so all of these tiles were made by the third, fourth, and fifth graders at JFK from 2011 to 2016. We put the very last tile on the wall this summer, so it was kind of exciting and momentous. They also were able to raise money um, through a grant to put in a very beautiful new greenhouse, and they actually saved the bottom three feet of the greenhouse um, so that we could purposefully put a mosaic on it. So it was an exciting way 
that by creating this first partnership, um, they then found ways to get future involvement and to get kind of that deeper level of engagement with the kids. And then this project is actually um, something that the teachers of JFK School got together and proposed for me uh, because the principal of the school was retiring after about 25 years, and he really was responsible for a lot of the development there. Um, so this was made not by their students, but actually by their uh, teachers and parent association, and this is one of those rare projects when they came to me and they already knew what they wanted, and so I really had a very little hand in it, which was exciting. Um, after six years, they really saw how we put these projects together, what they could be, and then they sort of pre presented a fully um, articulated idea. So the banner there reads, um, Mr. C inspires us too, and then all of the teachers created tiles that had how he had impacted their lives on it, so it was a really special project for the community. Uh, the next two slides are at another school in Port Chester, um, and they are a smaller project, but represent um, a collaboration with the social studies teachers um, and the science curriculum. One is based off of a poem uh, that a third grader uh, put together, and then the other uh, really illustrates the history of our village. And so it was the opportunity to really, again, reinforce what they were learning in the classroom and in the curriculum and give them a way to express that artistically. This is another bench project um, that actually was, was one of our more successful as far as building partnerships to make it possible. And this is actually in a community garden that's situated in one of the housing projects in Port Chester um, and was really the culmination of the community coming together and deciding that they needed not only a community garden to increase kind of you know, nutrition and health and access to food and getting people outside and, and kind of mobilizing them, um, but also a way to give them a, a beautiful way to create public art. This is one of my favorite projects uh, because it, it was working with about 300 kindergartners um, in a school district that uh, uh, had all of the kindergarten and pre-K in one building. Um, and so that was an exciting new system that I had not participated in before. Um, and it was fun to see that there really are no age limits on this process. Um, this isn't something that just adults or high schoolers and middle schoolers are able to participate in, um, that even the littlest hands can make a huge impact. This is decorating their courtyard. And this is my biggest project to date. Um, it's on the exterior wall of the Clay Art Center. And it is really about a, a four or five year effort um, with about 2,000 community members, including uh, the artists of Clay Art Center, as well as the residents of Port Chester, um, the school district, uh, different social service agencies, and tons and tons of volunteers and interns helped to put this together. And we'll get into exactly how these projects were installed a little bit later. Um, so I now want to, to show you other organizations um, that are doing the same thing or the same, have the same idea and are making it happen in very different ways, just to give you a broader perspective. Um, so of course, I'm going to start that with not a mosaic. <laughs> Um, I really felt that it was important to talk a little bit about mural arts, which is an organization in Philadelphia, um, because I think that murals are something that we were seeing for a long time before mosaics really came into play, um, and they really started to epitomize the idea of what public art does. Um, you know, introducing a, a new idea, a new concept, having people uh, confronted by this idea, um, having communities who, who felt like they didn't have a voice, giving them the opportunity to share that in a very public way. Uh, so mural arts, uh, worked with Shepherd Ferry last year during a project called Open Source. Um, and this is really a couple of, of murals that are absolutely incredible, especially when you're standing in front of them. Um, they are about the prison system and the reform of the prison system. And they're really attempting to give a face to the stigma um, of what happens to people who are coming out of incarceration and trying to transition back into their lives. And so he's really done that in an impactful way by sharing information um, and also creating this incredible piece of public art. Laurel True um, from Laurel True Studios is also an amazing artist. Uh, she works in Louisiana, but she also has a global reach, and so her projects show that in many different ways. Um, this is the Magic Archway, and it is uh, situated in a, in a housing project that is slated for uh, demolition. And so this is a way of honoring the memory of the residents who lived there, um, while also kind of getting people together. 
The Urban Eyes Project is also Laurel True. Um, and this is something that you will see if you are in Louisiana and you walk around a corner in an alleyway, you're gonna find projects by her all over the city. And then again, she works very internationally as well. So she travels all over. Um, and she designs mosaics based on community needs. So there's no one that is similar. And they all are addressing very different issues. This is Joshua Weiner. And he actually works in collaboration to make murals and mosaics um, together with other artists. His mosaics are, are primarily in Boston, and they are in K through 12 schools. They are in uh, synagogues and religious organizations. And then this one, again, is illustrating the history of his city using mosaic elements and a mural background. This is Network Arts, an organization in Philadelphia that is dedicated mostly to environmental science. Um, and this is something that is really exciting to see. So they really work with K through 12 public schools, um, but they house their projects in really public spaces. So this one here is at the Franklin Institute Science Museum in the heart of Philadelphia. It sees thousands of people every day, and it's really illustrating the environmental heroes um, that help to create uh, nature conservancy. So it's an ongoing theme with them, which I find really exciting. Again, it's kind of integrating and reinforcing things that they might be learning in their school curriculum um, in a really exciting way. They're using prefabricated tiles, um, and so the kids aren't making any of these themselves, but they're doing all of the installation work themselves. This is the Chicago Public Arts Group, and I really apologize for the quality of the slide. I just couldn't find a better image. Um, but I really appreciated this project. Um, I think it's important to really highlight it. It's called From Contemplation to Pride, um, and it's illustrating uh, Dr. Margaret Burroughs, um, who is kind of fixed in the middle there. Um, and on the left are people that she was influenced by, and on the right are people she then influenced. And it's, so it's showing kind of the generations of impact um, of this author in a way that is really exciting. It's on the outside of a uh, school. And this is, again, the Ch Chicago Public Art Group. This is, again, a, an amazing project. It's huge. It spans the entire city block. Um, and I am showing this image of the underpass here. Um, what you're seeing on the top is a mural, and then on the bottom is mosaic elements that are sort of working together to celebrate the centennial of Chinatown. This project was made in a public school, um, and it was really, it was designed exactly by the students who were coming up with meaningful symbols and involved a mural as well. This project is Grant's Tomb, and it is in New York City, and it's an exciting project for me, not because it's also a massive undertaking, but it really represents um, a different aspect of community making. So this project was undertaken by Pedro Silva in the 1970s. And at the time, it surrounds uh, Grant's tomb, which is on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And the community really came together. They worked with schools. They worked with residents to create these really flowing organic benches that are decorated by mosaics. But over time, and especially by the mid-1990s, they really started to see that these things were deteriorating. You could find holes in them. The mosaic tiles were popping off. And so the community that lived in this area really felt like um, it had become not only a liability, but an eyesore. And so they started getting together with the idea of maybe removing the benches. And so not only were there two ways of, of creating the benches with the community, but also the community then sort of mobilized to prevent the removal of these benches to another place. They felt like it was historically important that they were there at Grant's tomb. Um, and so they worked for about 15 years to restore them um, and to get people excited by this project once again. And it's really a social commentary on the city at the time. It's a lot of historical figures um, as well as images of daily life in New York City. This process also uses prefabricated tiles um, and is built with using found objects like uh, school desks um, that have chicken wire, mesh, styrofoam, and kind of a, a concrete skin, which they are building the mosaic on top of. In a similar way, this project, uh, which is Magic Gardens in Philadelphia, also really changed and became the economic engine um, for development in this particular community. This is in South Philadelphia, um, and the artist is Isaiah Zager, which you may or may not be familiar with. He came to Enseca a few years ago in Philadelphia. Um, and what you are seeing is his home on the um, upper part of the slide. 
and he really was a fixture in South Philadelphia for a long time. He moved in the 60s, and he started bringing artists into an area that formerly was old factories and condemned houses, and they sort of started revitalizing this area. Um, Unfortunately, they had plans to demolish much of it to put in an interstate um, that would bisect the city. And so he got together with his community members and really tried lobbying um, to prevent that from happening and, again, to kind of revitalize this area and make it a thriving place for artists to come and express themselves. And so what you're seeing, again, is his home, but it's also an abandoned lot that was situated in his neighborhood and sat empty for years. It was owned by a developer. And so what he did was he worked with his neighbor on the other side, and they sort of set up camp illegally by creating a community garden there in the middle of that vacant lot, and he started to build kind of this sculptural wonderland. Um, eventually, in the early 2000s, the developer found out that he was using this property in this way. And so he sued. Um, and asked him to either purchase the property or they were going to demolish the Magic Gardens, which grew over time to um, really become an exciting piece of public art and a, a maze-like labyrinth of mosaics. So a nonprofit organization was formed. Again, the community came together. They were not going to let this go. Um, and they helped Isaiah Zager start a nonprofit foundation that exists to this day called the Magic Gardens Philadelphia. Um, and it's now a place where you can go and have celebrations and events. You can tour it all the time. And Isaiah gives workshops and classes on his process, which he is definitely a rebel of the mosaic art. And we're going to talk about why that is so um, and exactly how he puts these things together in a very unlikely way. His spaces are really unique, and unfortunately I couldn't get an aerial picture of, of this process, but when you are standing, there's a, a parking garage across the street, and when you're standing looking down into the space, he's really created architecture using these mosaics. But you'll also see him all over Philadelphia. Um, he has hundreds of gorilla-like mosaics that are installed. You know, you could move a trash can and there could be a small Isaiah Zager mosaic. Um, and so you really, he became kind of a driving force for this community, and then it spread all over Philadelphia. Baltimore Clayworks is another nonprofit organization um, that really uses uh, the public art forum um, to engage communities of all ages. Um, this is also a nod to my mentor who trained me in the mosaic method that he was using at the time, named Herb Massey, who is still at Baltimore Clayworks. And this is a project that he did uh, with middle school students where they have created kind of sculptural uh, 3D elements and also are using prefab tile that they've broken up. Uh, Baltimore Clayworks also has a lot of satellite studios throughout Baltimore. Um, so this is an example of one of their most recent satellites um, and how they are using both mural and mosaic to decorate their space and let the community know what's happening inside. Also in Baltimore is the Visionary Art Museum, which is an exciting place to go in its own right. Um, it houses outsider art, and so you're going to see some really amazing spontaneous works of art. Um, but they worked for years to raise enough money, um, and do through crowdsourcing essentially, um, to start this museum. And then they decorated the museum by working with vulnerable youth and then later incarcerated youth to design and install these mosaics that decorate the entire outside of the building. Um, this is another one that doesn't quite fit exactly the mold for a mosaic artist. Um, his name is Stan Bitters, and he published a book in 1976 called Environmental Ceramics, and I stumbled upon it just by chance. Um, but it really changed the way I thought about how a project is put together, and that we don't just come together as a community to uh, make design and fundraise for a project, but we also have to really think about the installation of it. He makes massive, massive installations that he doesn't call mosaics. He, again, calls it architectural ceramics and environmental ceramics. Um, but I've never seen anything on quite the scale. Um, he has a warehouse where he actually builds these on the floor of his warehouse. And it's an entire village of people that he has to employ to put these together and then to ship them and install them. Um, you also might recognize his work uh, because it is the uh, installation at Duncan Ceramics. That's on the outside of the building. So now we're really going to dive into what you need to make this happen in your own community. And again, while there are so many diverse methods, I'm going to talk a lot about how I have done it in the past and how some of these artists have shared some of their techniques for me. But really, there is no golden rule for a lot of this. So what we're really going to cover is thinking about creating partnerships, um, planning and timeline, and funding, of course, is always a big question, as well as the creation, the materials you might be using, um, the installation, and the best part is celebrating it and really opening it for the public in your community. 
Um, partners, this is actually the most important part of the process. Before you ever create a tile, before you ever put pen to paper to try to raise funds for this, um, you need kind of a, a diverse group of partners uh, of various scopes and various sizes, depending on the project that you're really interested in. Um, don't underestimate how important they're going to be the whole way through the project. Um, you might have some in mind already. Can everybody see this text? It's supposed to be white, but it looks like it's showing up a little darker than that. It's important to aim for diversity in your partners. Um, so you really want partners on a grassroots scale as well as partners on a kind of a bigger picture, grander idea. Um, and they're gonna do different things for your project. On the grassroots scale, you're gonna find PTAs, residents, students, um, community groups that are, are really going to offer you kind of their enthusiasm and their, their hands-on work. On the big picture, you're gonna see housing authorities, local government, school districts and administration, and they're gonna bring um, a lot different things, funding, publicity. So you might be working with boards, and you might be working with museums, with other nonprofit organizations. And you really need to think about having a few partners that are on both of those scales that can really help to make the different uh, aspects of this project work. I couldn't resist using one clip art image. So it's really, really important that before you start your project, you all agree on what it is that's happening, the expectations that you have, um, and what your different roles are going to be. Um, so while it does sound like it, it might be kind of a fussy thing up front, I really suggest that everybody has some kind of a partnership agreement. Sometimes you might hear them called MOUs, Memorandums of Understandings, but really you need to have something on paper that outlines who is involved in this, um, what they're going to bring to it, and how exactly they, their level of engagement is going to happen. Are they bringing money? Um, are they bringing volunteers on a certain day to help you put the installation together? Um, are they outlining that you're gonna work with their third through fifth grade classrooms, et cetera? Um, and this is really gonna help to clarify the purpose that everyone has, um, and so that there aren't as many surprises along the way. So if this is not something that you're interested in doing too much of your own work on, you can easily get templates for any kind of partnership agreement offline. You can print it and just have it be a kind of a simple, again, outline of what you all expect from each other. Just continuing the idea of planning, I think it's important that you concentrate on the budget and the timeline. Um, and people obviously know how to put budgets together because you're buying your own supplies all the time. But there are things that you might forget. Um, it's important if you are not a K through 12 teacher um, that you remember that you need to be paid for this. Like you need to factor in some way of compensating yourself for the project and all of the work that you're gonna put into it. Um, as well as think about advertising. You're gonna need people to show up and contribute in some way. Um, and so don't forget that you might need to uh, have flyers, you might want a banner, you might want a, a big celebration um, or a ribbon cutting to really open this project. So there's lots of little things that should also be part of the plan from the very beginning. Um, a volunteer appreciation is a huge thing, especially if you are working in a large project and you anticipate having a lot of people donating their time. Um, it's important to have some way of making you know them know how much that they have contributed to the project. Um, the timeline is, is fairly straightforward, but you always want to think it's going to take so much longer, especially the installation timeline. Um, so I always start by kind of guesstimating um, a square foot of this project. So looking at a 12 by 12 um, inch space of this project, about how many tiles I think it's going to take to fill that space. And then using that number, come up with how much bigger your actual project is so that you can anticipate how many how much materials you're gonna need, but also how many people you're gonna need to make these tiles if you're working with students or community members or just doing it yourself. Um, the installation timeline should probably be a separate thing. You should really break it out on its own uh, because it's going to take a long time. You're gonna run into a lot of your challenges during the installation process, not necessarily during the making. Um, and so you wanna budget maybe twice as much time as you think that you're gonna need for the installation. Um, it also often depends a lot on your partners and their involvement when it comes to the installation. Um, and so that really does complicate things. Fundraising is always a big deal. Um, it's not as scary as it sounds. I, I think there's a big trend these days where you're finding that funders are not necessarily uh, as willing to fund an entire project. Um, 
And so what people are, how really are doing in a successful way is they're diversifying their funding streams um, by approaching local government, uh, your local arts councils, your state arts councils, your federal arts council, um, as well as take, looking to private uh, foundations and corporations and also in-kind donations. I, I think often I have called a manufacturer um, or I, and when we're doing benches, I've called the distributor of the benches and asked if they're willing to make a contribution of either ma the materials or some kind of discount for the program. And often people are really willing to participate. It's something that they want to be a part of. Um, so don't underestimate getting supply donations. It's so important to thank your funders. It's something that you can underestimate, um, but just by simply inviting them to the process, it, it really works. They either could show up on a day to see students creating the tiles, they could show up to see the installation, um, and if it, it's not necessarily something they want to have hands in involvement in. Um, funder tiles are another way to really thank your funders and their contribution. And I have some images of what some different funder tiles look like. And of course, they should be present at the celebration, and you should really acknowledge their contribution. So this is a funder tile for one of my projects. Um, and it's a, just a clay tile that we've included uh, everyone who has donated money, time, made in-kind donations. This again is, is the wonderful Isaiah Zager, um, which you can see it says Director of Special Projects uh, for <laughs> the State of Eternity. And when you really start to have that down, when you have an idea uh, of how you're going to be funding the project, either through grants or through uh, private contributions or in-kind donations, and you have an idea of maybe how long this thing is going to take, you can really then dive into creating your project with your audience. Um, this is obviously everyone's favorite part of it, but there are definitely some things that you should think about, um, especially when you're designing a project. My pro programs have always been more successful when I haven't gone in with an agenda, when I've really gone to the community that I'm working with, um, asked them what they would like to see, how they would like to contribute, and then formulated a plan after that. Um, the projects that haven't worked out so well are when we've gone into a community and thought, we want to put a mosaic here. You know, the funder has approached us and said, I want you to work with this particular community to install a mosaic. Um, and there just wasn't necessarily a momentum behind that idea for those community members. So really, I think authenticity and transparency are important parts of this process. Um, think about how this is going to impact people's lives, in what way, um, and make that part of your design. You also want to think about the transfer. How are you getting this project from a piece of paper onto the wall? Um, it's much easier, of course, with smaller projects. And I'll show you a few different ways that I've worked with both small and large process uh, projects to really get the, uh, the plan on the wall so that you can begin the installation. And we're also going to think about, is this an indoor project or an outdoor project? Um, the site that you are working with is going to define all of the materials that you buy, all of the installation methods that you use. So you should have this in mind really before you begin. I hate to admit it, but this is an actual mosaic design plan that I put together. <laughs> so they can be very simple. This is literally something that I threw together and was sending on to the school administration and the classroom teachers just to give them an idea of what it was that we were aiming for. Um, what I loved about that project was it was very organic. And so we had an idea. We were going to put together some of these elements. And then the installation for it didn't necessarily uh, need these exact things to be in this exact place. It was a very organic installation. Um, this is another example of a plan that I used that's just really a drawing on paper. A maquette can sometimes be a good way to work out any issues that you might have up front. And then, of course, something a little more uh, formulated. This is a plan um, I needed to present it to the board of the organization that we worked with. So I wanted something very fully realized. It was a new partner. So I wanted to make sure they could see it from beginning to end um, to really get them behind the idea of the project. This is another example of a, the bigger project that I have put together and how we really came up with a plan for it. At the time, I, we were lucky to have a volunteer who had experience using AutoCAD. And so she was willing to actually take this uh, drawn plan and translate it into AutoCAD so that we could print what is behind my head there in the middle. Um, she actually made sheets that we could print out life size so that we could transfer this large installation onto the wall. Um, it was incredibly time consuming. So what you're looking at right now is one of these life-size sheets 
that we then had uh, help from volunteers using a hole punch to punch along those printed lines and then using spray paint so that we actually left kind of a dotted transfer on the wall when we pulled the plan off. Again, this is not something that I would do with a small project. This is only something I would do um, with a project that this was about 500 square feet and we really needed to make sure that logistically we were getting things in the right places and that everything was an appropriate size. So it took a long time. Um, we then came back with paint to link all of those dotted lines together. Um, and this was important. We did this very early on, even when we were still making tiles for some of these pieces, um, because people could drive by and actually see the plan for the mosaic on the wall. It got them excited about the project. People came in and asked questions. They wanted to get involved. Um, and so it kind of did a, a lot of that creating energy for us. So exterior mosaics are, are really the trickiest that you're going to run into. You have to really combat with the, the area that you're living in, um, the climate the, for the region, and you have to think about freeze-thaw. That is really the most complicated issue that you're going to deal with. So freeze-thaw always wins. It really does. We're on the East Coast where freeze-thaw is a big deal. Um, and so what we have to do is find a clay body that really is not that porous so that it's not absorbing water and then freezing in the winter. Um, and as you know, when water freezes, it expands by about 10%. And so that porous clay body that has absorbed wall, a lot of water during the rainy season is then going to freeze. And as that expands, it's going to kind of burst off of the wall. So you want to make sure that you're using the right materials for wherever you plan to install this. Um, found objects can be a little bit tricky to use when you're doing an exterior installation because you really don't have any way of knowing how they're going to respond. So again, this is just what I have used. You can call your manufacturer and they're going to tell you exactly what clay. Um, they would suggest for an exterior installation. They know their clay bodies much better than I think any of us could hope for. Um, and so, so that you can really easily find one of these clay bodies wherever you are. It does not have to be my recommendation. Um, I have always used 420 and four, 547 from Standard. It's a very groggy body that I've always really appreciated because you can do a lot with it. You can work with kindergartners who are really mashing things together as well as adults and older adults to almost the same result. I have personally always used Amico Velvet underglazes because it's much easier to see what your end project is going to be. Um, and I of often work with a lot of children, and so this is just an easier solution. I fire everything at cone six, um, and that's important to know. You don't necessarily have to deal with that in an interior installation. But outside, you need to make sure that those tiles are, are fully vitrified. So the general idea is that you need a clay body that has less than 3% of water absorption per its mass. Nancy Selvage actually uh, took a formula that was put together by the brick industry, um, and I have a handout on it in the back that has a test that you can perform on your clay body at home um, if you would like to do that just to find out what its water absorption is. But again, it's really easy to just pick up the phone and call the tech at your local cer ceramic distributor because they're going to know what the water absorption for each of their clay bodies is. And I've gotten on a lot of websites and it's just right there under every clay. So I think the information is out there and you don't necessarily have to do all of this testing at home. So I think with this, you're, you're really ready to start creating these tiles. Once you have the materials and you have kind of an idea of how you're going to use them, um, this is the mosaic that I created with the kindergartners um, that involved creating dirt, worms, flowers, bugs, everything you can imagine. My methods have always been very different just based on the project. Hundreds of thousands of tiles are going to need to be created. Um, and I think you need to be aware of certain pitfalls that you might run into um, throughout the creation of each of these. Some things that are so easy, but you just don't think about it until maybe you're installing it on the wall and you realize um, that you've created more work for yourself is, is smoothing the edges. Um, when you're standing there installing thousands of tiles with interns, your hands get very cut up by things that, that maybe if they just took their finger and ran it around the edge, you could avoid. You always, always want to score the backs of your tiles. Um, if you've ever seen commercial tiles installed in a kitchen, a bathroom, and they have a grid on the back, it's the same idea. You just want to take some object and score the back lightly um, so that you really are giving the tile a better chance of adhering to the wall. It's the same idea of Velcro. And you have to watch the relief. I've always enjoyed highly textured tiles and mosaics. 
Um, but you do need to be careful and think about how this project is going to be engaged with. Are people going to walk by and be able to touch it or lean against it? Um, if it's kind of out of the, the public uh, path, then I think you have a little bit more leeway. But any time when somebody can really have direct access to your project, you want to be careful for anything that's sticking out. Um, so I have always had a rule of keeping it to less than a half an inch. And you want to think about smaller tiles. Um, your average thin set that you're going to use to install these tiles doesn't have a really strong tooth. Um, and so you might have some issues with things sliding as the thin set cures. So you want to think about small. Of course, I myself break that rule all the time. Um, and so often I have been presented with just wanting for the, the sake of the design to vary the size of some of my tiles. So I had some tiles here, uh, the heaviest was about 20 pounds um, that made up the tree for part of my mosaic. And there are definite materials that you can use, though they are expensive and hard to come by. Um, they make large format thin set. Um, and you ha can, there's an entire list of them that's on a website called custombuildingproducts.com. They will give you uh, thin sets that can be installed vertically, thin sets that are for large format, thin sets that are, are rapid curing. So it just depends on kind of what you're looking for for the site that you're working with. I have often had to contact a distributor and work through them uh, because some of these materials aren't necessarily made and sold in a retail way. They're for construction companies. Um, so this is another uh, opportunity where you can create a partnership, you know, calling your local uh, tile and bath uh, designer and working with um, their organization to get the materials that you need maybe donated to you. Uh, found objects, again, as I mentioned, they are tricky, but again, there's Isaiah Zager. He's, he's doing his wonderful thing. Um, he uses found objects in everything. So you can see here we've got rusty uh, bike tires. Um, he uses some native pottery uh, from his many visits, um, as well as glass, plastic, wood, metal, everything. And it works for him. It really does. But I think you do have to be aware that you should test everything. Um, you want to anticipate these things uh, being permanent. And so over time, how is this object going to degrade? Um, the zany thing about Isaiah is that his objects pop off the wall all the time. And he has teams of people who come back and repair it. So you're looking at this, what is obviously a terracotta object that's on an on exterior wall in Philadelphia, where they have a really harsh freeze-thaw cycle. So even as I was going back and touring his, uh, his site again, I could see holes in the wall where things had come off. It doesn't happen right away. It may not even happen in, in the first five years. But you will see that things will pop off if they are porous at all and are not following that rule of absorbing less than 3% of water. So again, found objects are, are not something I particularly use myself. But I see in lots of public art projects. And you just want to make sure that you're trying to avoid the more porous objects um, and just try it. I mean, there really is no necessary golden rule. Um, it works for Isaiah, and he's been making mosaics in Philadelphia for 30 years. Interior mosaics are much easier uh, because you don't necessarily have to battle some of those harsh elements. You can use any clay body you like, any glaze you like, the things that you, you know are really your favorites. The same rules for creation apply, and you really want to think about where this is going to be. If you're going to be having you know, kids walking by this every day in the corridor of their school, um, or if it's a bench and people are going to be sitting on it to enjoy their park. Um, so make sure that safety is really first. It trumps anything that's happening in the design. So installation is an exciting process. Um, I think it, it really is where you kind of seeing the culmination of your first thought process. And especially there's something so exciting about seeing a bunch of volunteers coming together to, to really put this together and get excited about it again. Um, so there are a couple of ways of installation. There's more than a couple, but really they come down to direct installation and indirect installation. So I have always favored the direct method, which is exactly what it sounds like. It's walking over to the wall and starting to stick the tiles on it. Um, and again, as long as you're using the right materials, um, it can be an exciting process. I've often liked to get the community residents and the community partners and the funders involved in this because it's exciting for them to see it finally come together. Um, so this is parents, teachers, everyone who's interested in participating really getting involved. So again, for the direct installation, they're going directly on the wall, usually face up. Um, 
but think that this method may not be the best for maybe larger transfers. If you have a huge project, you might want to think about using a substrate, which I can show you more about. Uh, for smaller, medium-sized projects, this has always been the way that I have done it uh, where possible. It takes a long time to do a direct installation, and you have to be there physically on the site. So think about the season and your timeline. Um, if you are finished with the project in the winter, you might have to hold over until it gets warm enough. Um, you'll see that a lot of those thin sets don't necessarily cure unless it's about 55 degrees or so. So that does kind of impact how you are planning these things. Um, it also means that for larger projects, you might have to sit there and have scaffolding that's out. Um, and how is that going to impact it? This, this mosaic uh, was right across from a parking lot, and so there were parked cars underneath it often. Um, and so that was a challenge that we kind of had to think about. If you're working in a school corridor, maybe the direct method right onto the wall may not be the best idea. Um, and occasionally a partner will request that a uh, mosaic is put on a substrate and sort of screwed into a wall so that if anything happened to it, maybe we, if it needed repairs, we could take it down easily and make those repairs. So you can really pick a method that best suits your circumstances. Um, this is just kind of showing the slow growth of this project over time. Uh, this project took about three months to install, and it took about 400 volunteers. I'm terrified of heights, which is ironic. Um, so this was really challenging for me to find people who are willing to uh, get on the scaffolding and, and get up there and help me put it together. And this, of course, is the finished project. Um, oh, just, just a note, those letters, Clay Art Center, are also uh, ceramic. So that was an exciting way that wasn't necessarily a mosaic, but was a way to kind of bring art into that public forum. Uh, this is me during that installation process. And I felt like this slide was important because you especially want your volunteers and anybody who's participating to know that this is permanent materials that we're dealing with. They're different forms of cement. Um, and so you will ruin clothes. <laughs> um, and you will probably track some of this home. So I think safety is really important. Um, and I always make sure that any of my volunteers who are minors um, go home with kind of a, a release that has information about the project and maybe some of the, the materials that we're dealing with so that their parents or their guardian know exactly what it is that they're doing. You want to make sure that safety is, is really important with the installation. So using a substrate, again, you can still use the direct method of installation. But using a substrate means you're just going to apply it maybe to a different surface. I've seen mosaics that have used cement board. It's what I choose to use myself. Uh, marine plywood, which is kind of a coated plywood uh, that resists water. Um, and hardy backer board. You can find any of this in a Home Depot or Lowe's um, and definitely get people to help you with it. This allows you to work in smaller sections. You can cut the board any size you wanted. So you could put it all together in 12 by 12 tiles if you wanted. Um, and it allows you to work indoors. So oftentimes when I, I haven't had the luxury maybe to wait through the winter to get the installation started, um, I've used a substrate because then I can work at a table um, inside with volunteers. My slide's not showing up there. Um, so this is an example of a substrate. You can see through the tiles the gray board underneath. Um, these boards usually come in about three by five foot sheets. And again, you can cut through them very easily to make them really any size that you would like. Um, you can also see on this next slide for that same project that the way I've transferred that particular mosaic blueprint was literally just using a sidewalk chalk and drawing on the different sections where we needed things. So it doesn't have to be the most precise, strategic, organized transfer if you know from the beginning you want a very organic uh, end product. Um, what you see here is hardy backer board. Um, what we were looking at before was cement board, the darker gray, and this is hardy backer board, which is a little more rigid. It also has a grid on it, which is nice and, and helps a little bit with the planning. I eventually did stop using hardy backer board myself uh, because it, it ended up very heavy at the end of these projects, and the cement board was a little bit more flexible and, and a little uh, lighter weight. So this is again showing the slow evolution of one of these projects during installation. You can see that we're inside, we're using an auditorium, and at times there were even kids doing performances in the, on the auditorium stage with us. Um, so this was just one of the only spaces that the school had to be able to do this. It takes a lot of time and a lot of manpower to make these projects really come to fruition. Uh, so the other method is really indirect installation. And again, that could mean many different things. 
Um, if you have regular and more standard sized tiles, if you're breaking up prefabricated tiles, instead of maybe using some handmade, more textured tiles, this is a great method for you. Um, what it really involves is laying out your tiles and then using some kind of adhesive sheet or a tape um, to tape all of the tiles together. And then you can literally pick them up and transfer them onto a board where you've put some thin set down. Um, so for smaller ones, anytime I've ever done this in a classroom and the students are making small personalized mosaics that they can walk home with, I have used this particular method. So this is an example of laying out some of these tiles. We were testing out whether we could do this uh, installation method for a larger project and it didn't happen to work for me but with smaller, more manageable things. Um, this is an example of, of where they have put the tape down first and then laid the tiles uh, face down onto it. And so you can see what he would then be able to do is to pick up the entire mat stuck to the tape and flip it onto the thin set. No matter which method you choose, direct or indirect, you want to think about um, sealing your project. Um, if it's inside, you still should probably seal it. You never know what you're going to be running into with people coming up and touching it over 30 years. Um, and outside, you really want to make sure that you've given your uh, mosaic any opportunity to resist um, absorbing water. Um, they sell tile sealers at any store. Um, and I often will even take extra precautions and use like a silicone caulking and run it over the sides and the top edge just to make sure that even if a tile became damaged for some reason, water couldn't get kind of behind it. So the actual installation is gonna require a lot of manpower. I, I don't think I've ever done a mosaic by myself and that's part of the excitement of it and it's something that really adds creativity and complexity to it. Um, so I have always relied on, on the kindness of volunteers, really. Um, I've recruited from local schools and universities, different community networks, um, parents, uh, students will show up and often wanna help out. With younger students, I always make sure that their parents are there. And again, if the students are coming by themselves, that they've gone home with some kind of a release that's outlining what it is that they're really gonna be working on. You really need to appreciate how much these people are doing. I mean, they're making it possible to get a huge or small project up onto the wall where before maybe it wouldn't be possible. Um, I always try to find opportunities to feed them um, and really kind of show them my appreciation. I've worked with a lot of high school and college aged interns um, where they're receiving school credit um, or they're you know, working to, to get something for their kind of college application process. And so that's always been a really wonderful relationship where they're learning a little bit about the artistic process while also kind of um, contributing to our project. And this is really the easy part, but you'd be surprised how often I've almost forgotten it. You know, after everything, you've created the tiles, you've done all the work and the research, um, and you're done. And you really want to make sure that you're kind of applauding not only everybody who contributed to the project, um, but giving your project a little bit of visibility. I think we're all trying to work together to raise awareness about how important the arts are. And by inviting everyone that you possibly can, and again, having a lot of visibility for your project, you're hopefully enabling an, an easier time the next time you're going to do a public art project. It's the opportunity to invite everybody who has helped fund the project and really put it together um, and give it kind of a public stage. Um, so this is a time where you can invite school administration, local government. I mean, they want their moment to also feel good about something that they might have helped out with. And I think you're really laying the groundwork for future projects. It's also giving the, the kids time to see a project that they might have participated in months ago and maybe even forgotten about and come back and now they see that it's finished. And then anytime you can, I always have a ribbon cutting. There's just something so satisfying about cutting a red ribbon around your project. And again, a lot of the resources that I mentioned, the organizations, um, some of the places you can find materials are on a sheet in the back there. Um, so if anybody wants to, to take those home and ha or have further research on it, they're there for you. Um, so now I think is really the time where I would love to talk about specific projects. If you had any questions, concerns, comments, um, please feel free to ask me. Thank you.
Hi, I have a, whoops, that's loud. I have a question, a couple questions. One is you said, and, and, and I do a lot of these, not that huge, mm -hmm. um, but the near, you said you use the marine hardwood, and mm -hmm. I would think that it would um, deter the adhesive. I don't use the marine plywood myself. You I don't. have seen other artists who have okay. used it without much to do. I definitely nece wouldn't necessarily put it outside. I, I think that's something you have to consider with your materials. Right. Um, uh, it depends on the thin set that you use. I use huh. kind of a cheaper one that I find from Home Depot. It's just your very yeah, standard yeah, one. Yeah. And that really may not have a good bond with it. But anything that's more customized, um, any of those thin sets we talked about that are rapid set would probably work. Okay. The other question I had, um, <laughs> don't laugh, I sand my walls uh -huh. because I don't want it to glue on to the paint and come off. And you didn't. And it I did for the larger project, yes. You did. With the heavier tiles. Because you're oh. right, the, the tiles are going to be bonding onto the <laughs> yes. painted surface rather yes. than the wall itself. So we did skin the wall and you put did. the mosaic up and then repaint it around it. Um, anytime you're using a substrate, of course, that doesn't matter. Right. And when the tiles have been smaller, sometimes I have avoided doing that. Um, or it's an indoor location. Yeah. OK, OK. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Hi, thanks. Your presentation was so great. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I just wanted to ask you for the outdoor tiles. You said you use the Amico velvets, and I was wondering um, what the clear was that you put on top. So I actually use um, a Duncan Envision glaze, which is actually formulated for classroom use. Um, I use it even though it's a technically a low fire glaze because I've tested it. I, I've done um, extensive testing on it to make sure that it's not gonna craze too much and therefore water could get in between and, and under and affect the fit of the glaze on top of the clay body. Um, and then I fire it up to cone six. But again, I, I think that any distributor is gonna be able to make suggestions for you. Um, I've used the velvets because it's what I, I was familiar with and I could see that there wasn't much change in firing those under glazes up to a higher temperature. Um, and, but I think that people have really started formulating under glazes to go all the way up to cone 10. And so when I first started mosaics, it, it, that wasn't necessarily true. We had a lot of change in them. Um, so I think I would just suggest calling your distributor and, and getting any technical information and just tell them what you're doing and they'll be able to s make suggestions. Okay, thanks. I'm sorry, just one more time. Sure. It was Duncan. Duncan Envision. Envision, okay, thank you very much. Sure. Hi, um, I was just wondering if I could get a copy of your PowerPoint. The pictures on it and examples were really awesome. Sure, no problem. I actually was considering uploading it to SlideShare okay. um, so that it was really usable. So if I could just maybe get your email address, I can invite you to the SlideShare uh, okay. program and uh, you'll be able to, to see all of these examples. And if you have the opportunity to ever go see any of them in person, I mean, it's a totally different experience standing at Grant's tomb looking at these benches um, than it is kind of seeing them up on a slide. Yeah. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks. Hi, I was just wondering when you are using a cement board and mm -hmm. you have um, all the mosaic made on it and you go to attach it to the wall, how are you getting it to set on the wall like what material are you using to actually adhere it? So you can think of it just like any other board. Right. Um, what, you, what I've always done is I've cut them down a little bit okay. um, because they do get very heavy once right. you've added That's thin set, once you've added ceramic tiles wondering. to them. Okay. So I've always saved a little bit of room for larger bolt holes. So I've, okay. I've maybe saved in the four corners an area where we don't place tiles um, so that we can then, uh, and when I'm working in a school at, or a park, I usually work with their um, kind of like public service um, and their maintenance crews to install them so that they can actually hold the board up to the wall oh, and okay. drill through it. So are you putting something, um, an adhesive on the back as well as drilling, or you're just connecting it through the drill? When it's ex an exterior mosaic, I have at times done construction adhesive, and I've really seen no difference okay. between that. Um, but I do seal the outside edge behind to oh, make sure okay. no water so can get behind So nothing gets in behind board. it, but you're just using hardware right. to Right, and when you're indoors, it. you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to use an adhesive. Um, and that way, if anything uh, were to happen, if they needed to, for instance, move the mosaic, if uh, you had a broken tile okay. that needed repaired, they could easily take it off by just un unbolting it. Okay, okay, great, thanks so much. Sure. Hi, your flyers were gone in two seconds. Oh my goodness, okay. Is there any way I can get a copy? Um, yes, if you would also leave me your email address, I can send them out digitally. Thank you. Hi, I was, I was hoping you could elaborate more on applying the mosaic over painted surfaces. So you sure. said you sanded it, um, do you use like industrial 
sanding or how do you ensure that you have a porous I have actually surface? not sanded it um, because I, I have found that especially when you're working in a public place, um, it's creating too much dust in the atmosphere to really think about. Um, so I have always used like a chemical peeler and I've done it like after hours, especially if you're working indoors um, so that people aren't around to kind of smell it. Um, I, again, I haven't always done it on smaller projects where the tiles are very small. I, you have to think about the weight of the tile. Um, when we've used larger format tiles um, and had huge projects, we have skinned the wall using a chemical. Um, yeah. what, what's the chemical? Uh, I've just gotten it from the hardware store. I think there's three or four different Spain kinds that are, are generally available anywhere. Okay. And um, in terms of sealing mural, what, what if you've already put one up and it may have absorbed moisture, maybe gotten dirty, what would you recommend for uh, post-installation? Well, unfortunately, sealing is all, they're all very different, um, mm -hmm. but I have seen that most sealers start to wear out after five or six years, mm -hmm. um, and so you need to go back and kind of reapply. If you're already seeing that there is maybe, um, I've seen some where mold has started to kind of work its way through the grout or onto the surface of the tiles, you can use like a, a concrete cleaner. Mm. Um, it is a form of acid though, so it just depends again on where this project is. Um, and if it's in a highly trafficked area, whether or not that is, is really a good idea. Um, but it probably just means that either there wasn't enough sealant on it to begin with, um, or maybe that it just kind of wore off over time. And you probably want it to be dry. You don't, you, you don't want to like wash it with water and seal it right after, huh? No, no, definitely not. So um, the weather has always been a big impact on all of my installation projects. Um, I've never sealed a project when I've had at least, without having at least 48 hours of you know bright dry weather okay cool thank you very much sure thanks did you say something about grouting the tiles that i missed you know that? i didn't talk too much about grout because i've always used a commercial blend um but i i can tell you my my advice with grout is really to think about how big your grout gaps are going to be um, some projects are, have tiles that are very crowded close together, in which case you might consider like an unsanded grout, um, whereas some of the projects I have done with larger tiles that I want more spaced out, I've used a sanded grout. Um, but I, I've, I've only ever mixed my own grout once, and I gotta tell you, it was way more work than it was, it was worth. So I've really gone forward using commercial grouts and just trying to find neutral colors so that it doesn't become too much uh, uh, part of the piece. What does Isaiah use to color his grout with? He uses a paint dye, again, because he's a renegade in everything that he does. So he, there's actually a company in Pittsburgh that he buys his paint dye from. I have his guide back there, and if you visit his website um, or call the organization, they'll send you a literal guidebook for how he puts his things together. It's amazing. They're very sharing with this information. Um, but I do warn you that any material he uses is not exterior rated. Like if you call the company, they'll tell you, do not put this on a wall outside. And he does. So I think it, it really is just up to you and your testing. But it's a, it's a paint dye that he mixes into the grout. He mixes his own grout. As you've seen, he uses very bright colors. Um, and I do believe it's two part two parts Portland cement to one part sand. Um, it is in that guide that I have back there. I just ask that nobody takes it with them because I only have the one. Um, and if you would like more information about his process, just give them a call and they'll send you one. Hi, I got here a little bit late, so I apologize that this has already been covered. But I'm especially interested in the front end process where you decide how to get the shapes of the tiles. For instance, the tree versus what I assume was more free form where the kids did probably their own flowers and you just put it together. Sure, yes, so I worked again with somebody who was skilled in AutoCAD, which was not a skill that I personally have ever had. Um, and they really laid it out digitally so that we could print um, life-size blueprints. I printed two, one set that went to transfer the, the uh, piece to the wall and then one set that I could actually cut up and use as templates. Um, so that I went into all of my workshops with artists and students and I could hand them, this is gonna be your exact shape of the tile for the tree. So it's they the, cut, they did their own clay and cut it to the template. Okay. Yes. Thank you. It's the only time I've ever used that method um, and it, it probably took longer than actually installing it on the wall, but it was definitely, it left you with a very accurate, precise and pristine project by the end. 
And did you just assume that clay shrinkage would create the gaps, or did you allow yes, for that? Yes, I have never factored in grout gaps. I've just never done it because it, it's it's always there. So um, the clay that I use doesn't shrink a lot, and so it's usually left me with between a quarter inch to a half an inch grout gap. Um, and occasionally when I've ended up with a larger grout gap, I've, I've gone ahead and finished it, and then over time as it's cracked, I've had to go back and put more grout in. Um, there's only a couple of times I've ever let the grout gap get bigger than that. Thank you. Okay, great. All right, thank you everyone, I appreciate it. And I'm gonna hang out here for a while in case anybody has um, more personal questions. Mm -hmm.